Well, hey, good morning. Good to see y'all this morning. Happy Father's Day to all my fellow fathers out there. <laughs> you know, I, um, Cassie, I want to thank you for um, you a couple times this morning um, really hit on the idea of God as our Father, and I and I I really appreciate that because um, not all of us um, have had great dads and great role models, and um, knowing that that we have God as the Father that can take the place of any of our crappy dad situations is is really, really encouraging. So th- thanks, Cass. I appreciate that. Um, well, this morning, uh, we are in week two of our uh, sermon series, Summer in the Psalms. Um, this, uh, as we've been talking last week, um, you know, the Psalms have had a dominant impact in the history of, of the people of faith, really. Throughout world uh, history, the Psalms have been in, in, um, incredibly impacting. Um, they are a, a prayer book, a praise book, a, a worship book for God's people. And the Psalms, what the, the, they, they give us the right vocabulary. Sometimes we, we don't know what to say or we don't know how to say it. And the Psalms can, can give us those words that, um, that sometimes we, maybe we don't even have the courage to say ourselves. We can read what the psalmists say. And so we can speak truth to God. Uh, we can speak truth to ourselves in the midst of our relationship with God. And so the Psalms provide like signposts, patterns that we can look to um, for drawing near to God. And so we have this amazing in the Psalms 150 song vision of God intimately involved with his people. And then our response to God's involvement is to what we're talking about this morning, worship. Worship is a response. So um, I, if you would uh, join me as I uh, kind of open this time up with a word of prayer, that'd be, that'd be awesome. God, it, it is, it's comforting to know that the lyrics that we just sang are, some are, are so true, Lord. Um, even when we don't see it, you're working. And I know sometimes it's hard for us to see it. And um, some of us, uh, we, we do see it. And, and it just, there's seasons of life where we do and we don't. And God, we know because of the testimony of, of the people of faith for, for generations that you are here and you are among us, and God, we thank you for that. I pray that your spirit would um, would work in our hearts, translate um, any uh, feeble attempt I may, might make um, into, um, into your heart for these people, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as we're going through this series, one of the things that we're doing is we are hitting on some of the major themes throughout the Psalms. We're not covering all 150, all right? Though you should be, if, uh, if you were here last week, we handed out um, where there was available in the back um, a, a sheet that where over the next eight weeks, the series is nine Sundays long, but through the next eight weeks, we're reading through as a church family all 150 Psalms. So there's a few each day, you get Saturdays off, um, and so um, you can pick those up uh, in the back. Don't worry. You're like, oh, man, I'm a week behind. It's fine. It's fine. Um, a really cool way to do it um, is uh, if, if you want to catch up is you could listen to it. If you have like a Bible app, a lot of them read to you. Um, it's great. If you're commuting in traffic, it'll keep you from being angry. <laughs> or you'll get on some wonky like lament psalm and be like, Oh God, why are all these people cutting in front of me? But it, it'll, it'll, it'll help you, it'll get you through. So anyway, so, um, uh, so as we kick off uh, t- today, um, we're talking about worship, but we gotta define like what is worship? And we'll talk about that in a second, but first I wanna talk about what worship is not, okay? Because sometimes you can know something better about what, what something is by knowing what, it, what it's not. So I have a, a, a four things that I wanna make the point about that it's that what worship is not. Worship is not a musical genre, despite what uh, Christian culture has marketed to us. There's great marketing that, you know, there's this whole genre of music that you can look up on iTunes as praise and worship. 
And, um, and, and yeah, okay, that helps us to kind of know the lane that it's in, but that is not worship. You get that, right? Okay, the next thing uh, a worship, uh, worship is not, it's not a sing-along with a Bible study. And some of us maybe have that kind of mentality. It's like, okay, well, this is the part where we sing, and then we get to the sermon, and, uh, and, and you know, um, or it becomes like our parking theme. Um, you know, it's like a theme music where we come and then we find our seats and then we get to the sermon. You, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like I went to, to Aquatica with my family yesterday and you know, when you're walking into SeaWorld, like the, the grand music is playing. Cause I get, do you feel that way? I, I don't know. Anyway, um, it's not nice music to help you find your seat is what I'm trying to say. That's not worship. Number three, uh, worship is not a performance. Now, excellence matters for sure. We want to give God our best. And, and um, the leaders are not here to entertain. What I love about our, our worship team here at Northwest Hills is they really get that. They, they love excellence. They love pursuing excellence. But, but it's in the effort to pr- provide for you all the, the best, most dr- distraction-free environment that you can connect with God in, in this moment with the other believers. And so... Um, I, I love that about what we have here, but worship is not also free therapy. You, you know, so it's not, the, it's not, a lot of times we approach like the song time, worship time, whatever at different churches as like this free therapy. It's like we try to get, the, we want to get the emotional buzz that's going to like carry us into the week. You know what I'm saying? Anybody? Now, our corporate worship experiences, no matter how inc- incredible they may be, I mean, we can have, like, a- amazing music. That's not a bad thing. But we have to be honest. Um, when we say that was amazing worship, like, you go home, you go to whatever, I don't know, wherever you go to eat or something like that, and, and you say, wow, that was amazing worship today. Uh, what are you saying? Are you saying that you actually connected with God, with other people, or are you saying, well, um, that was an emotionally powerful experience? Let, let's, let's be honest with, with, with what it is. And so some of us approach it that way, almost like it's, it's three, free therapy. And, and the truth is that emotions have nothing to do with the amazingness of the worship, okay? How good we feel, the, the buzz that we get has nothing to do with what, how good it is or not. I, I learned this uh, early on in, in Bible college. Um, some of you who are newer, um, uh, the previous pastor here, uh, Doug, was uh, one of my professors when I was in Bible college. And every, uh, we, had, we had chapel twice a week. And I had, uh, my sophomore year, I had philosophy with him right after chapel. And so we would come down and we'd come into class and he'd be sitting there waiting for everybody to come in. And he'd sit there and say, oh, how was chapel today, guys? And then we'd sit there and talk about, well, I don't know. I didn't like who they had doing worship today. You know, they didn't do that good. I wasn't. And and we went through several weeks of that before he finally was like, all right, now we need to have a talk. He was doing it to make a point that, that, um, that our approach in worship is not about, um, it's not about the emotional high or the buzz that we get. It's, in fact, um, you know, Gethsemane, Jesus, where he prayed the night he was betrayed, um, he was in agony over the cross that was before him. Uh, he sweats drops of blood. That was, I would argue, one of the most powerful worship experiences in all of Scripture. And it wasn't a pleasant experience, was it? And so emotions are an amazing gift that, that God has given us. But what are we saying when we, uh, when we say, I like worship at that church or this church? What are we saying? We're saying most of the time, I like the warm and fuzzies. And we should be honest about that because music is a vehicle. It's a vehicle that we all get in and it takes us from point A to point B. Some churches have a van, some churches have a bus, some churches have a a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, and some churches have a Ford Pinto. You know, it's just, we, we have like, it's all a vehicle that we all pile in and we go someplace together. And so when Christian culture constantly uh, refers to worship as this product to be consumed, rather than a heart posture that is to consume us, then we have a worship problem. We buy into that. 
So what is worship? Well, you know, everybody does worship. Even people that don't want to follow God. Because worship is something that is, is baked into our humanness. And so whatever commands our highest affection, our highest respect, whatever we, we put on that pedestal, that becomes our God and that is what we worship. And so any good thing actually can become um, a, a false God in our lives. All of us, all of us can take that good thing and then make it an ultimate thing, and then we end up in this, this danger zone of worship. And so whenever something good in our life um, makes that leap to idolatry, um, it shows up in the following ways. So these are going to be warning flags. Just imagine like somebody warning, warning with the yellow flags in your life when you see these things pop up. If I have something in my life, and I can have some of these things that they don't, but these become warning flags. So if I have something in my life, I, I'll sacrifice for that. I'll spend time on that. I'll spend my money on that. I'll talk about it. I will protect and defend it. I will serve it. I will perfect it. I will think about it. I will worry about it. I will get angry when someone blocks me from it. And I will build my schedule around it. It actually kind of sounds like having kids, but... Besides that, if these things start popping up in our life, we should have, see like some dude wa or dudette, whatever you want, waving the, the yellow warning flags in our face. Think about what you're doing here. Where's your priorities? And it's because when something or someone else other than God starts to hog all the things on that list, then we might have a worship problem. So what is true worship? Here's our operative definition for today of what worship is. Worship is a response, both personal and corporate, to the revelation of Yahweh. That's the name of God. Um, it's translated as the Lord in some passages of Scripture, but of Yahweh for who he is, what he has done, and what he will do. It's our response, both personal and corporate, to the revelation of Yahweh for who he is, what he has done, and what he will do. So we got, I, I'm, I'm gonna go through, uh, we wanna see, we wanna see worship this morning in 3D, okay? So I have three dimensions of worship, and guess what? They're not alliterated. I don't have D words, so you, you can be happy about that. I, 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 some pastors, it's like, like, I'm gonna alliterate everything. We're not doing that today, it's fine. Okay, the first one is this, the first dimension of worship is adoration and proclamation of God. It's that, that declaring of who God, this is what we, we do when we come together on Sunday mornings and we're singing together. We are adoring God. We're proclaiming God and who he is and what he has done. And you see this everywhere in the Psalms. As you're reading through, there's the, all of this adoration and, and, and proclamation of who God is. And, and honestly, it's the very first thing that the church did on Pentecost, as, as the Holy Spirit came on uh, the, the people and, and they began to, you know, speak in tongues and preach the gospel and all this stuff, um, they, they began to proclaim who God was, who he is, what he has done. And um, everybody that wasn't a part of their, like, group kind of thought they were drunk because of how excited they got about it. And I wonder what would happen if that's how excited we got. The people thought we were drunk when we went out to lunch. Not saying to get drunk at lunch. I'm saying, what if, what if people were like, man, these people are like so hopped up on Jesus. It's like tough crowd this morning. All right, second dimension of worship is serving him by living out his character in service to others. So we adore God, we proclaim God, but now we're gonna serve him by serving others, demonstrating his character. God created all of us in his image. That means that we, we're his representatives in this world. So we bear his character, we're, we're supposed to bear his character in this world. And so um, let's look at a couple Psalms. Psalm chapter two, verses 10 through 11. 
It says, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So it's this call to serve. Now it says kings, rulers of the earth, but you gotta understand that, yeah, I was talking about kings in that time, but there's a reason that Israel, that God didn't want Israel to have kings. And it's because God created humanity to rule and reign with him in this world. So each and every one of us, if we are followers of Jesus, if we are a part of the family of God, we are kings and queens in this world called to rule and reign with Jesus. And so this is for you. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. So we're gonna serve him, but let's, let's fill this out a little bit more. Psalm 15. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against a friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Do you get the idea that the people of God, the people that are under the tent of God, that are a part of the community of God are people that reflect the character of God. So we serve by reflecting the character of God to the people around us. Third dimension of worship, participating, participation in the divine life and mission. Divine life and mission. This is my favorite dimension of worship because it's mystical. And mystical weirds people out. And that's fun. Um, the, I mean, the, the, that's, it's hard. To, you, the mystical, you have a hard time wrapping your head around. But beyond the first two dimensions that we talked about, we are, as, as followers of Jesus, intimately involved in the life of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We become intimately involved in his life. So um, it's more than just singing to God where our praise goes up. It's more than um, just serving others where our praise goes out. We are invited into uh, the, the mystical relationship with the divine triune God. And so it's this mystical union of Father, Son, and Spirit. And I say mystical, there's a mystery to it. It's inexplainable. It's, it's, um, it's, it's hard to even observe, but we're invited to participate in this divine life. Let's get a glimpse of what that looks like. John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. For I do not ask for these only, but also those who believe in me through their word. This is Jesus' prayer. He's saying, I'm not talking about the disciples, just, not just the disciples, but also the people that will believe in me through their message. That's you lovely people. Jesus is praying for you. He says, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Man, that is, that is as mystical as you get. How do you, like, I can't explain the triune God and how God, God the Father is in Jesus. I mean, they're, and that's the same unity that we're called to be a part of. I don't, what does that look like? Well, we get a little bit glimpse. Fortunately, John wrote uh, another few letters later on. Um, and uh, in 1 John, uh, it says this, chapter four. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe 
the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So you see this communal participation of life and, and putting an, a, like trying to nail it down, like it just doesn't do it justice. It just has to be this, I, I love you and you love me and we're a happy family. Oh, um, well, yeah, okay, let's, let's go with that. But, but we, we're in this love relationship together with God. It's us participating in life. Participation is important because participation is about our union. It's, it's the togetherness, us together with God. And it's also about mission. And the, the incredible thing about union and mission is that it's like a chicken and egg scenario. They feed into each other. When we, when we are truly one as followers of Jesus, then it propels us to mission. And as we propel into mission, we become more and more one together as a people. And it just keeps repeating itself the sharing of divine life. And so when we worship as, a, as an element of, of this, this union that we're talking about, when we worship with the Psalms, we are participating in worship with Jesus. I kind of hit on this a little bit last week, but I want to drill down on this a little bit more because this is profound. You might need to, if you have any duct, spare duct tape, just wrap it around your head because it's about to blow. Okay, so the New Testament thinks of the Psalms as the prayers of the Messiah. In, in, look, let's look at Acts chapter 2. This is Pentecost. Peter's preaching the very first sermon on Pentecost, and he says this. He says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb, it's, it's right over there. It's here to this day. But he was a prophet, so David's a prophet, and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what, has to come, what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. Uh, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. That's interesting. In fact, that is kind of a crazy claim because Peter's making this claim in the midst of uh, to like a crowd of thousands of, of, of Jewish people. There's probably a few Bible nerds in the mix, a few Old Testament scholars that might not see eye to eye with him. But Peter's making the claim that David foretold in the Psalms the resurrection of Jesus. And so somehow David was this witness to Jesus because, G, uh, because David is the ultimate anointed king and uh, Jesus is sort of the Messiah. David is like a, a, a prototype of what Jesus will become. It gets better though. Let's, let's continue on to Hebrews. So in Hebrews, so Hebrews does this incredible thing, the writer of Hebrews, where um, we're, we'll see a couple Psalms pop up in these passages. And the writer of Hebrews is talking about these Psalms like they are the actual words of Jesus. We're talking about like maybe a thousand years separating Jesus and when these were written. But it says this, uh, Hebrews chapter two, verses 10 through 12. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And he says, and this is where he quotes Psalm 22, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. So he's saying that back in Psalm 22, those are Jesus's words, but Psalm 22 wasn't written by Jesus. It was written by David who wrote it. I want to take a moment. This is a devotional moment. This is a freebie, okay, this morning. Um, 
I don't know if you know what you just read or what I just read, do you? Um, what, when it says the assembly here, this is a, 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 a code word that should clue us in that he's talking about God's heavenly throne room, like God's heavenly staff team, they're all together. This is God's heavenly court, his kingly court. And, and what he's saying is, Jesus is not ashamed to call you as you come, as you die, as you come. Some people, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm all scattered on this. Let me say this first. Some of you have been told throughout your life that you need to be deathly afraid of entering the presence of God. And I'm not saying that, I mean, he's God, so <laughs> be respectful. But, and if, if you're not, saved, then that's probably not a great thing. But if you are, I, I've, I've, I've met so many Christians that go through their entire Christian life fearful of standing before God one day. And what the writer of Hebrews here is, is communicating is that Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother and sister. And so when you enter into the throne room of God one day, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus introduces you to God face to face and introduces God to you. Hey, dad, it's my brother. Hey, bro, this is dad or sis, what, whatever. Like this is this incredible moment where we come into the presence and, and God and Jesus declares who God is to us and, and Jesus declares to us that we are his brothers and sisters. And some of us need to that deep in our soul. Because we walk around, we're, we have given our lives to Jesus, we have been saved by his blood, and we, we carry these shame burdens like God, God wouldn't love me. I mean, he, he saved me, but he just tolerates me. That is not true. All right, I'm totally off what I was talking about we were talking about hebrews chapter 2 and um and the quoting of psalm in hebrews chapter 2 let's jump to chapter 10 verses 5 through 7 the the writer of hebrews quotes another psalm psalm 40 he says therefore when christ came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased then i said here i am this is Psalm 40. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. This says, okay, listen, to, Jesus, it's the, the writer of Hebrews say, is saying that Jesus said this when he came into the world. So did Jesus say it in like baby babble? I mean, like, we don't have any record of Jesus actually saying this. The writer of Hebrews is, is, is jumping into this idea that Jesus says the Psalms and the Psalms say what Jesus says and there's this overlap and interlock of, of how they represent Jesus in this world. And so this is where, you know, get your duct tape out. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I, I talked about him a little bit last week, spent a ton of, of time in the Psalms. And I think he wraps this up perfectly. The prayers of David were prayed also by Christ. Or better, Christ himself prayed them through his forerunner, David. And so with, with this understanding... The Psalms become so much more than these ancient words that we read on a page, these songs to a God. The, these, these Psalms become this way that I abide in the divine life. I enter into the divine life. When, when I worship through the Psalms, I'm actually participating in the worship and divine life of Jesus. And he's participating with me. I get to worship with Jesus. 
One of the things I love more than anything in this world is worshiping with my wife. Just standing next to her, as our eyes closed even, singing songs of adoration to God, I, I, I love it. Because she's with me, we're together, and there's this, this mystical thing that happens where I feel closer to her in that moment. I don't know if it's because I, when we, before we were dating, or yeah, before we were dating, I used to stare at her across chapel when we were supposed to be worshiping. I don't, it could be that, partly that. But, um, and then I'd catch her looking at me and then I'd look off. Anyway. There's something about worshiping with my wife, with my family. And, and, I, have, and I have so many friends that I feel the, the, not the same way, obviously, about, but I feel very similarly about. I love to get together with these friends and, and, and worship our Savior together and it's there's something unifying that happens in the spiritual world when we do this together. And so worship in 3D is proclaiming God's greatness, our adoration. It is living out God's character, that's our service, and it is participating in the divine life and that is our union with God and others. And so we do that Sunday mornings. That I mean, that's, uh, that's a whole lot of adoration time where we just come and we sing and we love on each other and love God. But there's a, 167 hours the rest of the week that we have to deal with. That's where service comes in, where we're reflecting God's character to the people around us. And then the union of God as we become more and more one with him, the gifts of the spirit manifest in our life and we see God working in the lives of others. So all of this comes back to our definition. Worship is a response, both personal and corporate, to the revelation of Yahweh for who he is, what he has done, and what he will do. Now, there's a, there's a couple, uh, some different schools of thought when it comes to preaching a sermon. Some people say if it's going to be a long sermon, it should never go over 30 minutes. People's attention span is 20 minutes, but people are listening to like three-hour podcasts nowadays, so I'm pretty sure people can handle it. Um, and so, like, I, I, I you know, I kind of, I wrestle with that, but here's the deal. This is one where I'm sure some, like, finger-wagging person would say, you should have broke that up into two sermons. And I would say, no, because you, because you sleep during the week. And I don't remember what I had for dinner Thursday. Do you? No, probably not. You'd have to think about it. And so some of these things need to be dealt with together. So now that we've set up this first part, we got to move into the second part because some of you are like, he hasn't even touched on Psalm 116 yet. And I know that's on the bulletin. We're getting there. Okay. Okay, we want to worship God. It's personal and corporate uh, uh, from the revelation of who he is, what he has done, and what he will do. Who he is. Um, we, in one of the like, coolest stories of, of this sort of God's revelation of who he is, is um, in the time of Moses, he's up on the mountain. He says to God, I want you to reveal yourself to me, God. And God says, listen, you, you can't handle it, dude. <laughs> You just can't handle it. He says, but listen, I'll hide you in the cleft of a rock and I'll sort of pass in front of you and um, you'll kind of see me kind of walking away and, and that should be sufficient. And um, you know, Moses is like, okay, that's good. And so this, that's the setup for, for this passage in Exodus 34. And this is where you get God's own words of who he is. He says, then Yahweh came down in the cloud and stood there with them or with him and proclaimed his name, Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children of the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now I need to stop. Some of you aren't gonna get past that last part, but it's part of the saying, okay? 
in Hebrew, the most important part comes first, okay? We save the best for last, okay? So you're stuck on the last thing probably. The best part's first. Now, the last part can't contradict the first part. The first part talks about forgiving sin and rebellion and things like that. So this isn't God like punishing generational sin. This, this, is, this is a whole, and we can, if you need more information on it, I can get it to you. This is a, a whole understanding within the ancient world that, um, that listen, the same, God's gonna treat every generation the exact same. If, you, if, if this generation rebels against him, he's gonna like, you know, he's gonna treat them accordingly. If the next generation does, he's gonna treat them accordingly. But the idea, the, the key point is that God, he maintains love to thousands and forgives wickedness and rebellion and sin. Our God is a loving God. This is his revelation in his own words of who he is. And guess what? This is like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. You know how, like in our culture, you go, you see John 3.16 everywhere? Um, you know, people paint it on their like naked chests when they're at like football games or something. Um, yeah, it's weird. But, uh, you know, it gets people's attention, I guess. Um, this is like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. And so the Psalms begin to uh, reveal who God is based on God's own self-revelation. Look at Psalm 145, verse uh, 1 through 9. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the, gracious, uh, the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim of your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Yahweh is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Did you catch it there? Exodus 34 echoing through here. So when the writers of scripture want to describe God, they go back to when God introduces himself and, and talks about his character. And so what we know of God is not rooted in our own emotional experience, okay? What we know about God to be true is rooted in like God's own words in the scriptures. So that tells us who God is. Now let's we're actually combine the, the, the latter two. What he has done and what he will do leads us to praise. It, there's a style of Psalms uh, called Thanksgiving Psalms. And, um, and, and, and we're gonna read one here in a second, but it is this idea of, of thanksgiving and loving God as a part of my thanksgiving. And the problem is, is, in, Ameri is in American culture, um, we talk about love uh, or we love things because I want or desire those things and it gives me all the good feels. I mean, really, like, I want that thing, so I love it. I, I want that person, so I, I, you know, I love them. They give me good feelings. And you know what? I love donuts in that way. But I can't love God in that way. Because sentiment and good feelings do not guide what, what love is. And as a church, we, we've, we have to get this. Loving God means I work to elevate the worth of God and, and others, even at personal cost to me. Because that's how Jesus first loved us. He elevated God, he elevated others at personal cost to him. That's the standard. So I love God, I, I, I love others, I, I elevate their worth, I, I, I lift them up even at personal cost to me, which means um, I follow God even when it doesn't make sense. It means I trust him even when it hurts. It means I inconvenience myself for others even when they're not really worth my time. 
by certain standards. And I do it because that is what God is like. That is his character. And that's what the psalmist means when he says, I love the Lord. I love Yahweh. Let's jump into Psalm 116. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. I love God because he heard me. He responded to me. Our God is a God who responds. And then you get this sort of flashback um, little thing within the psalm. So um, cue flashback noise. Flashback. Uh, verse three and four, the cords of death entangled me. So this is what God saved him from. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. Sometimes, I mean, we, we might wonder, well, I wonder what it was that he went through to feel that way. But you know what? It doesn't really matter because all of us have felt that way, have we not? All of us have been in that situation where, where the, we, we feel just oppressed by just all the just junk in our life and we call out to God, save me. Okay, back to the present. The Lord is gracious, verse five, and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Did you, did you hear Exodus 34 again? Echoing in there. I can confidently praise God for what I know he has already done. I can praise him because I know he has saved in the past. And that gives me confidence as I go into the future. So the key is that the regardless, regardless of our circumstances, because of God's track record, we can be confident for our future. Uh, continuing on in verse seven. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. How many of you need to preach to yourself from time to time? And that's what the psalmist does here. Rest, my soul. The Lord's been good to you. And then we go back into the flashback. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. And my alarm said, everyone's a liar. Now, um, that seems pretty cynical. And sometimes I feel cynical. Do you feel cynical sometimes? Everybody sucks. Can't, I can't, I just, I, I can't do it. I, just, um, I desperately need prayer, uh, prayer Lord. I, I desperately need rescue, Lord. Everybody sucks right now. <laughs> it's right there. The psalmist gives you permission to say it. But verse 10 echoes, I trusted in the Lord when I was there. So this is not like just saying, oh, well, every, everybody stinks. Everybody's the worst. That's angst. But that's just angst. It's what the psalmist kind of inspires us to do or should inspire us to do is that in the midst of my angst, I'm still going to trust in God. And, and that's where love begins to take place. You see, Abraham, when God, like he's the epitome of faith in, in, in all of Scripture. Abraham God like shows up one day um, and Abraham's never worshiped uh, God before. And God says, hey, um, pack up your stuff. I'm gonna take you to this land that I'm gonna show you. And um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. And, and Abraham's like, oh, sure, cool. And then goes, packs up his whole family and, and, and then they go. And, um, but then when they get to the land, the very first thing that, Abraham does is he builds an altar to Yahweh, to his God. Now, you, you probably don't understand how audacious that is. Because in the ancient world, they, under, they, they had this understanding that their gods were over certain territories. 
So there was a God over this region, a God over this region. And so what Abraham was doing was he was following God. He goes into the territory of another God and he builds, altars aren't small, okay? He builds an altar to worship God in the midst of enemy territory. And their relation, they haven't been dating that long. But, but Abraham lavishes this love towards God. And, and, and it's this idea, I, 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 I'm using this to illustrate this idea that we, we worship God regardless of our circumstances. Sometimes we're in enemy territory. Sometimes it feels terrible, but we continue to express our love and devotion to God. Look at what the psalmist says in verse 12. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? How many of you feel that way? How, how many of you felt that with another person? They've given you a good gift. You feel like I gotta give something back to them. Anybody? Okay, so, so that's our, our, our inclination to do that. How do you give a gift to the person that has everything? Right? How do you give a gift? God, like he literally has no needs. How do you give a gift to the God who has everything? Well, I think the psalmist in verse 13 answers that question. What shall I return? He says, I will lift up the cup of salvation and I will call on the name of the Lord. So I'm gonna give back to God by taking. Who gives by taking? That seems odd. Well, kind of. I I have this friend, dear friend, um, and she cooks some of the best food. I mean, hallelujah. Um, A lot of of times we would, uh, for a period of time, we would go out over to their house after church and and eat. And sometimes it was just leftovers. And it was still good. I'm not a leftover fan, okay? Um, She, I mean, fantastic. And she she has this incredible ability. Um, She worked in a cannery for years and years. And she has this incredible ability to like, pick apart everything that goes into a dish. So she can like take like a a spice rub and be like, okay, that has, okay. And and she picks everything apart and she can recreate it. She's that good. She's incredible. And, and, and so she, she loves, she's very hospitable. She loves cooking for people. And so when she invites me over to her house, I go over and the way that I give back to her is I go back for seconds. And some days fifths. That, that's how you give back to someone. That, that, that's the idea here, that, that, that God lavishes upon us. There's nothing you could give him back in return but to take what he has given. In fact, when you read uh, this, if you were to read this in the Hebrew, verse 13, when it says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. This is a water bottle, not a cup. I didn't want to kick over water on the stage, okay? The Hebrew word is kose yeshua. Did you know that your Savior's name is salvation? So you could almost say, I, in my response to this God that lavishes his gift upon me, I'm going to lift up the cup of Jesus. What do you do with a cup? You drink. And so in response to this good and wonderful God that, that loves and lavishes upon me with all of his goodness, the way that I say thank you and I give back to this God, oh baby, I drink. Not done yet. I drink deep. When you come to an awareness of who you are and that you are called to celebrate and be a part of this intimate fellowship of the living God with his people, you've got to drink deeply of the cup of Jesus. It's the only appropriate response. It is the heart of our worship. 
And, and, and even though I live in, in the territory of, 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 of false gods and idolatry and evil all around me, even though my circumstances aren't great, I still drink deeply of the cup of Jesus. The amazing thing is when I drink deeply of the cup of Jesus, Psalm 145, verse 18, it says, all, the Lord is near to all who call on him, all who call on him in truth. I know that God is with me. When I take up my cup, he is there. Verse 14 of Psalm 116 says, I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. So it's not just me taking the cup and it becoming a personal worship of taking Jesus into myself. The psalmist um, reflects an attitude that we need to all have that I will, I will live out my faith in the presence of the people of God. This operative definition that we've been talking about, worship is a response, both personal and corporate, to the revelation of the Lord for who he is, what he has done, and what he will do. I have talked to many people over the years that say, you know, I can worship God just fine at the lake. No, you're not. You're drinking beer until you pass out in your boat. That was kind of a joke. Uh, I mean, I, maybe not. I guess I've known people that do that, but um, I was supposed to make it a little more lighthearted. But um, no, no, I've, I've talked to many people. I, oh, I can worship God great in the mountains. Uh, fantastic. But that's not true worship. It's not total worship. I, I worship God great on a mountain. I worship God great with my feet in the water. But it's not true worship because worship is not just something personal it's corporate. How many times in those scriptures did we read the assembly, the gathering of people over and over and over again? If you want to be a worshiper of Jesus, if you want to be a worshiper of the one true God, then you must drink deeply of the cup of Jesus in community. Because it's only in community that I begin to actually know more about who God is. Because you are supposed to be imaging God to me and I to you. It's only in community that I know more and more about what God has done in the lives of people around me. Because you're telling me what God has done in your life. And I'm telling you what he's done in my life. And that gives us hope as we go into the future. And so if you want to follow Jesus, I invite you to drink deeply of who he is. And if you, if you have not done that before, I, I want to give you any opportunity that you can to come talk to me. As, and, and we can talk about baptism and, and steps to be able to, to fully drink of the cup of Jesus. But we got to do it together. That's true worship. Would you pray with me? Lord, I come to you and, and thank you for your great love and your kindness and that you are the great God that is compassionate, slow to anger, full of love and faithfulness. And I pray that that truth becomes more and more real in our hearts and propels us towards worship of you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.